If you open up YouTube today, it seems like every business guru is interviewing a billionaire. Everyone's got $200 million and people are sitting on enormous piles of money. But today I'm gonna to tell you what the YouTube gurus never tell you about real business. Just by watching the thumbnails, it seems that everyone is a $100 million CEO or a $300 million CEO. Everyone has a $50 million a year company. Everyone's a billionaire. I see more people who, I took a private jet with a billionaire, and yet I look and I say there are fewer than 3,000 billionaires in the world. Some of them never show their face. You've seen the Mars family, for example, that most of them have never ever even been photographed in public. Many of those billionaires we've increasingly talked about don't even speak English because they are more billionaires being minted at a faster pace in countries where they might not speak English and they certainly don't want to go on YouTube. And so I'm not calling anybody out. I uh, believe that more free information is a good thing, more commentary, but I think it is often overhyped. There are so many different ways to calculate things. And when someone says they're the $200 million CEO, is that because they have $200 million in the bank? Is that because they made an aggressive valuation of different companies or a company that they own? They said, hey, under great conditions, I could sell this for 200 million. Is it they own a part of a company that's worth 200 million, but their part may be only worth you know, 20 million? Is it they had $200 million in revenue, but it's at low margins? Is it they've made $200 million in their lifetime? I mean, there's so many different ways to do this. And I think it's worth understanding that you know, not everyone is doing that much better than you. Obviously, you wanna learn from people who are more successful. I love watching interviews with Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos, and I've been watching about Carl Icahn and Bill Ackman, all these guys in the finance and entrepreneurial world recently. There's a lot that we can learn, but I feel like YouTube and social media in general does a disservice by basically putting these labels on folks that are done using calculations we don't even understand how they come. And so as entrepreneur who's at times felt smaller than others, when I use real world numbers and they use you know crazy numbers, here's a few tips that I wanted to share with you for how to feel good and grow your business. Obviously, again, you don't want to give up on the lessons you can learn from more successful people, but you wanna realize if you have a business and you're growing it, you're doing better than most. Only a very small percentage of businesses ever make a million dollars a year, even in revenue, let alone profit. It is easier than ever to get there, and yet most business owners don't. So that's where you wanna learn from other folks. If you're running something that is, let's say, brick and mortar, and all the, the velocity people who are making a million dollars a year in profit are doing so online with consulting, they're doing something in affiliate marketing or online or whatever it may be, you know, maybe that's something to shift into. We've talked about how try and look beyond your local market, try and look beyond your national market. How can you sell your products and services internationally, not only to detach you from being rooted somewhere, but because there's less volatility when you have more markets and more people to sell to. But only a small percentage of people make it to that level. So if you get there, you should pat yourself on the back. Only 65% of businesses are even profitable. And I'm not just talking about the unicorns and the money that just, the people that just get money dumped on them. We're starting to see fewer of those companies in a recession because the money is going to dry up. But if you have a business and it's growing, you're doing better than most. The second thing is that being risk averse is a blessing. I often wonder to myself, yes, there are people who have $200 million. There are people who have a billion dollars. And I don't wanna take that away from them because I really believe that in much of Western society today, it is more of a curse than a blessing in the eyes of society for someone who has become successful. People look at it as a grievance that you've made money, and that's not what I wanna do. But I also understand that there are folks out there who said, hey, I'm the $1 billion CEO. Look, the guy who ran WeWork was, and look what happened. Now, he got bought out. He had a soft landing, but how many people start companies that maybe one day it's worth a billion, and then something happens? Look at a company like Juul. We worked with some folks who had deals with Juul, the smokeless uh, tobacco company. I mean, they were, they were getting investments at a 10-figure valuation, and now it has fallen something like 97%. Look at how many stocks were flying high during the pandemic. Look at Peloton, look at Carvana, look at Lemonade, look at all these companies that have lost 90, 95, 99%. I'm not saying that because people who started those companies or who ran those companies should feel badly. Those numbers at the top were crazy in some circumstances. And obviously you should understand that if you got to a certain point, you can get there again. It's the lessons that you learn by getting your company to a certain point that even if you fall later, you got to that point where you should then have learned what is a person who's running a company at 10 million, 20 million, a billion dollars a year learn, and you go out and either build your company back to that level with those lessons, or you go out and build the next thing. So this is not trying to take away from anybody, but how many companies fell? And so for me, the path that I would prefer as a risk averse person, and this is why 
I go offshore. This is why I've gone where I'm treated best is because I would rather have a clean linear path to one year you make a million, then you make two million, then you make three million, then maybe you make six million, maybe one year you go back down to five million, and then you go to 10, and maybe, you know, for a year or two it's flat, and you figure out what's the plateau I've got to clear through, and then you get to, and you just kind of consistently go up and build a business that has more recurring revenue, that has, you know, more customers coming in, that has better lead generation systems, that has whatever it is you need to keep growing your business. And with it, the enterprise value of the business grows, and the enterprise business keeps growing because when you cross, you know, the million dollar EBITDA marker, you can get a, a bigger valuation because now you're entering into a bigger kind of buyer. When you cross the $10 million, now you get a different kind of buyer who wants to buy your business in the future. And so that kind of ongoing growth to me seems a lot more comfortable than I want to start at zero and go to a billion dollars overnight. I mean, maybe for a different reason he didn't work out, but look at a guy like Sam Bankman Freed. One day he goes from zero to $15 billion and the next day he's broke and now he's having a lot of problems. If you can get to multi-billions, that's great. Even if you have that ability, to me, you should focus on a much more linear approach. I believe it was Mark Cuban who said, if I went broke tomorrow, I could become a multimillionaire again, but being a billionaire would take some luck. I'd have to be in the right place in the right time. Now, the person who's been a billionaire is gonna know, just as I said, the best way to get back there and the best way to find that luck. You can make your own luck. You can take advantage of the circumstances around you. And if you know what to look for, you'll be, you'll be better equipped to go. But my question is, every business I've ever run, I say, how does this business fail? I don't take out debt. If I had to go back to, to me and the dog running it, we could do that. How does the business ever fail, right? Things slow down, maybe you trim things, or maybe if you're building a business that has good margins and has good systems and you follow the advice that we talk about and you reduced your tax bill to zero or two or 5%, you'd have plenty of money in the bank to keep your staff on board even when you went through a difficult time. So you see a lot of businesses that take on too much risk, they take on too much debt, and that's why 20% fail in the first year, 50% fail in the first five years. Those numbers are a little bit different in different countries. I think those are largely US numbers. But I ask myself, how does my business fail? I also ask myself, how does my business become worth a billion dollars tomorrow? And the answer is, it really probably doesn't because I've chosen to say, I'd rather have a very clean path of getting to 30 or 50 or $100 million and doing so over time, taking the Warren Buffett approach than taking the Adam Newman or taking the SBF approach of saying, how do I get to a billion dollars as quickly as possible? How do I raise funds? Because there's a different kind of risk that you take on when you bring in investors. Number one, in our profession, a nomad capitalist, I see a lot of people who have investors, they get forced into the Delaware C Corp model where they pay a lot more taxes than they have to if they were to go overseas because their investors tell them where they have to incorporate and tell them where they have to live. And so they're giving away a lot of the profits that they could have saved in taxes if they followed our offshore model. And that's gonna be the money that they may need to to keep things afloat or to keep putting money back into growth even when things slow down or they hit a plateau. So being risk averse is a blessing, but you're not gonna see too many people talk about that on social media because it's just not sexy. Private jets are sexy. Putting a, your face with a big banner, $300 million, that's sexy. Is that person gonna be at $300 million next year? Some absolutely will. Are they gonna be there in 10 years? Some absolutely will. But for me, how do I make sure I stay at my level to where I'm really never going backwards on a personal level? Even if my business plateaus, that's better than being high one day and shot down the next, as, as Sinatra would say. Businesses have ups and downs, and I've hated to learn that part. You love to get to new levels, but the most important thing that you should learn whenever you hit a peak is, what do I do here? When we first hired a COO, I almost immediately shifted into, okay, now I'm an entrepreneur who has a COO. And I've done so for other hires that we've made where it's like, okay, I have a big boss now, right? And he's the, he's the big boss. What does that change in me? You reach a new revenue plateau. Hey, it's one thing to be in a million dollars and there's a certain way you act. When you get to $10 million in revenue or 20 million or 50 million in revenue, you're gonna act in a different way. And so you have to understand that that's more important than protecting yourself from every down because everyone has downs. They don't talk about it on YouTube. They don't talk about it when they're, you know, again, calling themselves the $200 million CEO. But to me, the key thing for really successful people is how do I save money wherever I can? So Alex Hermosi has talked about this. Warren Buffett has you know, talked about this as well. Like have some money in cash, right? Charlie Munger, I'm not uh, embarrassed to have be a little bit heavy on cash, she would say, for a business at a certain size. And so in the same way, you may not wanna be that heavy on cash when you're just starting your business and you're putting everything back into growth, but when you get to a certain point, you reach a certain level, having some money in cash, having some money in very secure assets, maybe you create a dividend portfolio, maybe you have a kind of a simple stock portfolio, maybe you put some money into lifestyle real estate, I've done that with homes around the world that are in markets that generally speaking have gone up in value. 
And so I'm giving myself diversification. I'm giving myself a hedge. I'm giving myself a place to live. I'm giving myself access to go and spend time there and learn more about the markets that maybe I want to expand my goods and services into to grow my business in a less volatile way, serving more people and not just one market. So put your money into stuff at a certain point. You don't want to be entirely focused on growth, in my opinion, because if you run a lean business, which is what I believe in, I try and keep things very lean. Look at all these tech companies that are laying off 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people right now. They didn't need those people. Look at Twitter. You have like 7,500 people for a company that various you know, other tech companies are running with 500, 1,000, 2,000 people, even less. You want to run a lean business. And so if you keep a lean business, if you keep your taxes down because you're running your business from Dubai, if you're running your business from Singapore, if you're running your business as a nomad, if you're traveling around the world, if you're living in a place where the taxes are much lower and you keep things lean and you stay risk averse and you learn lessons as you go on, you are going to be just as good in terms of the mindset and your ability to create wealth if you have a sustainable business than the $200 million CEO who talks about this. So get your company as productive as possible. Get your tax rate as low as possible. Get things lean and get focused on how am I going to be better every year? Call it the 1% a day better principle. Rather than trying to be 100% better today and then seeing big downturns, how do I try and improve everything by 1%? on an ongoing basis. Nomad Capitalist helps people who want to move their businesses out of high tax countries like the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and others do so in a legal way by giving them access to a suite of experts and our own personal expertise that make sure that no stone goes unturned, make sure that everything's compliance where you leave, everything's compliance where you're going. If you're gonna incorporate it offshore, you don't have to live in Dubai just to incorporate in one of Dubai's free zones, for example. And so many entrepreneurs wanna live in a certain country and incorporate in another, bank in another, hire employees in another. That's how you run a lean business. That's how you increase productivity. And I believe it's the easiest way for someone who wants to follow my approach of a risk averse linear business building rather than shooting up to the sky and then hoping you can stay there and having to take on debt, having to take on partners, having to take on people who tell you what to do, having to you know have things get in your way. Those are the lessons that you don't see from the people who were making videos on the private jet. I've avoided the flash for much of my life. I prefer to be frugal. I prefer to keep building slowly, understanding through personal experience there will be ups and downs. And that's what I want every entrepreneur to take away about how businesses are really built and how you can get there faster.